This is part five of the lecture on imaging the eye and orbit. Let's talk about extraocular muscle enlargement. The classic radiologic differential diagnosis for extraocular muscle enlargement is Graves' disease versus orbital pseudotumor. Obviously, a variety of other things can do this, like a malignancy will uh, thicken the extraocular muscles, inflammation will, but this is a classic radiologic differential diagnosis that deserves some attention. Interestingly, this is not a major differential diagnosis on the clinical side, because Graves' disease tends to be painless and symmetric, whereas orbital pseudotumor, the myositis form, tends to be painful and unilateral. So um, this, is a, this is a radiologist inventing a differential diagnosis that doesn't really apply clinically in most cases. This is the classic example of Graves' disease, thyroid orbitopathy. As we know, this is actually an abnormality of antibodies directed to the thyroid gland, which accidentally cause proteoglycan deposition into the fat and muscles of the orbit. This uh, disease is symmetric, and it occurs, it affects the muscles in a very predictable pattern, where the inferior rectus muscles affected first, then the medial rectus, then the superior, then the lateral, and lastly, the oblique muscles tend to be, tend to be unaffected. Uh, the mnemonic for that is I'm slow, I-M-S-L-O, to remind you of the order of involvement. You can see how symmetric this disease is, and it has the classic order of involvement. This is Graves' disease. This is a very different appearance. There is only one enlarged extraocular muscle here. Well, at least one complex. This is the superior rectus complex, and it is markedly enlarged while all of the other extraocular muscles are normal. There's no involvement of the right side. So this is a unilateral disease, not in the characteristic order of presentation, and usually these patients will present with ocular pain, sometimes pain on moving the eye. Remember that myositis is only one form of pseudotumor, and we'll return to that concept later. How about infection? When we are called upon to evaluate infection of the orbits, usually what is being asked is whether it is cellulitis or, or a subperiosteal or retrobulbar abscess. The clinical scenario is that a patient comes to the emergency department and their eye is swollen shut with obvious cellulitis of the preceptal soft tissues, and it's very difficult to examine the patient and determine how far back the infection goes. Does the infection go back behind the septum, or is it purely preceptal cellulitis? In order to answer that question, you've kind of got to know where the septum is. There's no actual line seen radiographically where the septum is, but it goes from the center of the globe to the nasoorbital ethmoidal region right along there. So you have to kind of know that that's the boundary separating the preceptal space, where there's a lot of inflammation here, a lot of cellulitis, and the postseptal space, where the fat is pristine. This is an example of purely preceptal disease. Preceptal disease can be treated with medical therapy, but postseptal disease uh, at least is under consideration for surgical treatment. This is a particular type of retrobulbar or postseptal abscess. This is an abscess. You can see that this is displacing the medial rectus muscle that should be right up against the lamina papyracea. It's been displaced away, and in its place is a rim-enhancing fluid collection with a lot of infiltration of the surrounding fat. This is an abscess, of course. This abscess comes from a particular place, though. Notice that all of the ethmoid air cells are impacted. This infection has come across the lamina papyracea and has been constrained by the periosteum of the lamina papyracea. Thus, it is a subperiosteal abscess, a classic form of abscess within the orbit. Now let's talk about non-infectious inflammatory diseases. Let's return to the subject of pseudotumor and uh, mention sarcoid briefly. We often talk about the myositis form of pseudotumor, but there are in fact six different forms of pseudotumor. Three of these are associated with particular pieces of anatomy and three are geographic. The most common form of pseudotumor is in fact the myositis form, so that's one. You can also get a dacritis form in which the lacrimal gland is inflamed. 
you can get a neuritis form of pseudotumor, which strictly speaking is a perineuritis because the inflammation is around the optic nerve, not in the optic nerve, instead in the nerve sheath and surrounding structures. You can get an anterior or episcleral form of pseudotumor. You can get a posterior or apical form of pseudotumor, or you can get the diffuse form in which the entire orbit is inflamed. Sarcoid is a fantastic mimic of any of these forms of pseudotumor. Here's an example, the same example, of the myositis form of pseudotumor in which a single muscle, or in this case a single muscle complex, is enlarged and inflamed. There is often inflammation extending into the surrounding fat. This is the perineuritis form of pseudotumor. You can see that there is a halo of enhancement around the non-enhancing nerve in the center, right? Any enhancement in this area is bad. It should fade in the background like on this side. This is a ring of enhancement. If you're thinking to yourself, this looks just like that meningioma case we were talking about a few slides ago, you are correct. This looks just like a meningioma and that is a very important differential diagnosis. In patients with this imaging appearance, we will often presumptively give steroids in the hopes that it is a treatable pseudotumor and not a meningioma which has a much worse prognosis. This is the dacritis form of pseudotumor. You can see the normal lacrimal gland on this side and this lacrimal gland is enlarged with enhancement extending into the surrounding soft tissues. This is the episcleral form of pseudotumor. You can see abnormal enhancement along the posterior wall of the globe. Notice how the fat is pristine on the, on the uninvolved side. Here there is abnormal enhancement, but it's restricted to the anterior part of the globe, just or the anterior part of the orbit, just behind the globe. If you see that 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 uh, coronal cut going, going right through here, you can see a lot of that inflammation and really appreciate how it affects the surrounding fat. This is the apical form of pseudotumor. Notice that the muscles are involved, the perineural soft tissues are involved, everything's involved, but only in the posterior half of the orbit. And this is the diffuse form of pseudotumor in which every orbital structure is inflamed. Thankfully, this disease is usually responsive to theroids. This is an example of a mimic. You might look at this and think, oh, look, there's the tram track sign, it's meningioma. Or you might look at this and think, oh, that's perineural en uh, enhancement. This is, the, uh, this is pseudotumor. Those would both be reasonable differential diagnoses. I think the clue here is that the same thing is present on the other side, suggesting that this is a more metabolic diffuse disease. And in fact, this turns out to be sarcoid. But it is a fantastic mimic, and you could certainly understand where this Differential would include meningioma and pseudotumor. Let's focus on the optic nerve. We've talked about the differentiation of glioma and meningioma. We've talked about pseudotumor. Uh, let's focus now on optic neuritis. These two images are the same two images that we started out the lecture uh, when we were talking about normal anatomy because these two are the critical go-to sequences for imaging of the orbit, the fat suppressed T2 and the fat suppressed post contrast T1. So when you're looking at these, it's really easy to see the asymmetry, but you've got to know which is the normal side and which is the abnormal side. This target sign with the dark nerve in the center, the bright CSF around that, and then the dark sheath and suppressed fat around that, that's normal. This is the abnormal side. There's a whiteout on this side. The nerve is either so atrophic you can't see it, or it is so edematous that it has blended in with the surrounding CSF. In this case, it's the edema thing. Let's look on this side. Once again, asymmetry is evident, but you've got to know which side is abnormal. You've got to know that although the extraocular muscles are supposed to be enhancing, the optic nerve and its sheath are not, and it should blend into the background. This is abnormal enhancement. It should not be enhancing like those extraocular muscles. And this enhancement and edema, this is optic neuritis. Anytime someone says optic neuritis, you should think in your mind, Multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is uh, tightly um, associated with optic neuritis. In fact, half of people who present with optic neuritis will go on to a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and half of people with multiple sclerosis presented initially with optic neuritis. This is the end of part five of the lecture on imaging of the eye and orbit. One more to go.